First of all, thank you very much, and congratulations on being interns, I believe. Is that the right title yes. here at the Institute? And I'm so honored to be at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. And I'm going to say a few words about the US elections and foreign policy, if I may, and then take your questions. Uh, I understand a portion of your group is from Spanish-speaking countries, and I just met them briefly. And I told them uh, that I would be teaching at Sciences Po in Paris this fall. And I'm going to teach, I'm going to follow the American elections as they unfold. And you might say, well, how could you have a whole semester on the American elections? Well, I'm going to do a few extra things. I'm going to start out in early September with uh, 24 French graduate students. And uh, we will be talking first about uh, the basic elections that we're having. I'm going to have each student take one contested U.S. House race, one contested U.S. Senate race, one contested gubernatorial race, and the presidential race. You probably hear most about the presidential race. But I think it's important that we think a little bit about foreign policy and the American elections. And I don't mean to in any way uh, uh, say that the elections in other countries aren't just as important or more important sometimes, but that's what I'm teaching about. And probably the elections in England are equally or more important sometimes. But the American Constitution gives, uh, gives, the, uh, gives the Congress a great deal of foreign policy responsibility. Uh, for example, uh, senators in the United States have the, the duty of advice and consent on all ambassadors and all appointments in the State Department and consent, that means they're co-equal uh, with the president in making those appointments. We tend to think of foreign policy as being made by the president, but that is not always true. Uh, in fact, there's probably more uh, uh, foreign policy matters created in appropriations bills uh, or in uh, legislation and foreign assistance acts and uh, so forth. Uh, but in any event, the question is, how does this uh, play out in elections? I cited in the brief time I had with the other students a, an example. For example, the Cuban-Americans. Anyone here from Cuba? I, I didn't uh, notice, but in the United States, the Cuban Americans seem to have an unusually large influence on foreign policy. Uh, although they are only just a small fraction of the people, then the reason for that is, in my opinion, that most of them live in Florida or New Jersey. Not that they didn't plan this. But those two states are swing states in terms of Senate races and a lot of House races. And a very small percentage of people, two or three percent, can influence the whole state. And of course, uh, they're both uh, states that are swing states in presidential elections. And as you know, Florida can go either way, and New Jersey can go either way. So the Cuban Americans are very influential. Both parties compete for their vote, and they are interested in not having relations with Castro. So that has gone on maybe longer than it would have otherwise, and people can't understand why if 80% of the people are for relations with Cuba, we continue not to have relations with Cuba uh, or normal relations. And I would su submit to you that the reason is that New Jersey and Florida, both, in, they can rep both those states can, rep can produce Republican senators, as now we have Marco Rubio, who is a Republican senator from Florida. And we also have a Democratic senator from Florida, and we have now two Democrats from New, Jer from New Jersey, but that is a swing state that sometimes produces Republican senators and always produces several Republican representatives, and Florida is the same way. Uh, and then we get to the presidential races where Florida and uh, I don't think New Jersey is considered a swing state now. All this is jargon from the United States, and I do apologize if I'm uh, jumping ahead a little bit. But 
what I shall have the students do is to try to listen to some of the debates in the House races and Senate races and see what foreign policy issues are currently being discussed. No doubt Afghanistan will be discussed, uh, issues of free trade, there will be issues of immigration uh, discussed extensively, which is a part of foreign policy. And so our foreign policy does come up in U.S. House races and Senate races and uh, uh, frequently in the debates uh, for the presidency, I think one, I think there are going to be three presidential debates and one of them will be devoted to foreign policy. And there is a, a historical, uh, historical precedent, rightly or wrongly, to uh, how much some of the presidential debates can, uh, can affect our foreign policy. For example, in 1960, long before any of you were born, um, President Kennedy, uh, then Senator Kennedy, was running against Vice President Nixon. And Vice President Nixon was leading, and it was thought that Nixon was more for being the Republican, was more for strong national defense, and he had been with Eisenhower and so forth. And Kennedy declared in one of the debates that we had a missile gap and uh, subsequently research has found that we really didn't have a missile gap, but it didn't matter. He said we did, and he probably believed that we did. But this led to a great debate, and it made Senator Kennedy appear tougher on defense than Vice President Nixon, who suddenly was soft on defense. So this is what happens in the last month of a presidential campaign. But in terms of policy, when Kennedy came into office, he started the largest military buildup in history. And in his inaugural speech, he said that we will bear any burden, carry any torch, or go any place to, and th thus we've gotten involved in this whole series of small wars, uh, and he sent more troops to Vietnam and so forth. But you can debate all that right and wrong. What I'm trying to get the students to understand about American elections, if they are interested, is that they do have consequences. Elections have consequences. Now, a lot of people don't participate in the elections uh, for one reason or another, and uh, uh, I think that that is uh, unfortunate, but on the other hand, I don't think people should be forced to uh, vote if they don't want to. If they're uninformed, they, sh they probably shouldn't vote. So all those things tied together uh, will uh, illustrate the effect of uh, our elections on foreign policy. I know that all of you have submitted a number of questions and I did not see the questions until just recently, but I'll answer any questions that you might have. Now, are, are, are people going to ask me the questions now or is this something for later? Okay, but the students won't be able to hear. Okay, well, um, is that, uh, I, I want to follow your format here. Now, let's see, now, what else could I tell you about? Uh, I very much admire England and uh, 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 its system. They've had elections for a long time, but we have a lot of problems with our elections in the U.S. It's very hard to have fair and free elections in any country. The very first thing we're going to do in this class is to look in the nominating process. It's, it, it's very difficult to get good young people to run for office because you have to give up a lot. You have to give up your privacy, but also uh, you have to raise money in U.S. elections. And this is a problem in terms of getting people who have foreign policy experience to run for office. Not that they know any more about it than any domestic taxpayer, but that's very important. Um, a second thing about our elections is that we are a evolving democracy. I always say it's a struggle for democracy. Uh, Kennedy sort of defined that we were fighting for democracy worldwide. I'm not so sure that democracy always works out that way. There have been a lot of uh, bad people elected in elections uh, in this country's history that we're in uh, or uh, a lot of other uh, countries as well. So uh, we are in an era of world history where we, we say we like democracy, and we do, and we're going to keep democracy. But the challenge is to make it better, to make it work better. 
we have a very severe problem regarding who is registered to vote. We've had some organizations such as ACORN, which has been put out of business, but several foundations that try to register people who believe what they believe uh, in the elections. And in many states, all you need is a, is, a, is a fuel bill or a telephone bill addressed to you at an address and you can register to vote. That's different from paying taxes. It's different from lots of other things. So large numbers of illegal uh, uh, persons, illegal immigrants, we, we call them. Uh, I don't necessarily consider them illegal all the time, but that's what they're classified on. They have registered to vote in many states, such as Florida and California. Now there's a big debate, can we clean up the lists, that is, go back and just get people who have driver's licenses or people who are citizens and so forth. So we have a large, in, in California in particular, there's a large uh, portion, not a large portion, but a high percentage of the voters would not be citizens. And the question to some people is, is this appropriate or isn't it? Well, if they live here, should they vote? Uh, and so forth. So we maybe have more co a more complex election process than European countries have. Uh, somebody here can tell me how your countries get such a high percentage of vote. Sometimes in some countries when you go to vote, you're registering for your taxes or you are uh, registering for the census or something like that. So it's necessary to go and vote to accomplish some other objective. Is, is that true in, in some of your countries or is that not true? In, yes. You're obliged to vote in Belgium. So you, uh, and what if you don't vote? Can you be prosecuted? If you don't vote, if you don't vote, they check on you and you must have voted six times. Okay, well, that, 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 that's one way to get more people to vote. Um, <laughs> now, it's been suggested by one person that we, to get more people in, to vote in the United States, we make it like a lottery. You could, you would get a lottery ticket there and maybe you would win something. but. I don't like that because I don't think people should vote unless they want to vote and unless they do some work to inform themselves. Just to vote, it can be dangerous. You might be voting for a party or a referendum or something that you don't know anything about. Uh, the, our ballots are very long in many states. Uh, we, uh, in the state of California, a ballot can be as long as 25 pages long because they have referendum and uh, initiatives on it, in addition to voting for several candidates. They are trying something new in California. They, in the primaries, they have everybody on one ballot. So in the general election, you can have two Democrats running against each other. For example, Congressman Sherman and Congressman, I can't think of his name right now, in California are both Democrats and they will run against each other in the November election. And there are other instances where two Republicans will run against each other in November. But the, the, the California initiative is to try to get more independents involved. Uh, and it was uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's initiative. Now, whether that's going to work out or not, so far it's not working too well. So we are struggling with democracy, uh, just as all your countries struggle with it. In some countries of this world, uh, democracy is used as a way to elect a dictator. Uh, that can happen. Uh, how do we protect the rights of the minorities? Well, we have built in certain things where we do not have one vote, one man. That's a very, and, or one woman. Uh, but one man, one vote does not work very well. And uh, uh, when I say one man, one vote, I also mean one woman. I would be my objective. It's so like in law, I went to law school, and they have the reasonable man standard uh, that you use. So can there be a reasonable woman? Well, yes, obviously it means, so it's used by our Supreme Court as the, still the reasonable man standard, but it means the reasonable woman standard too. But in any event, um, uh, we have a continuing struggle for democracy. Eisenhower once said that the price of freedom is constant vigilance. So we have to keep trying to do it better, improve every time. And uh, uh, I'm not so sure that we're doing it any better than we have in the past. I'm, I'm not so sure that uh, if you didn't come back in 100 years, we would find that democracy has evolved into some kind of a thing where, maybe like the ancient Greeks had, uh, to elect some kind of a, a deep thinkers who will guide us. I think we, we yearn for a benevolent dictatorship or something like that, but it's hard to get it. Um, and. Um, 
So those are just some thoughts on the elections. But anyway, I'm going to take my students and after that we're going to go through and we will uh, have the reports on the debates from each candidate. And uh, that's another thing. A lot of House and Senate seats are not contested. That is, uh, only about a third of them are contested because the incumbents are so strong sometimes and sometimes they're not. It just depends. Then we'll have Election Day on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. And uh, I guess I can remember that because I've run for office so many times. I remember when the general election is. But then uh, in November, we'll look at the election results. We will then look at our electoral college because the race for presidency is really not the popular vote. It's the electoral college vote. And it's very possible, it's happened several times in American history, that the one who's gotten the most votes has not won the presidential election. Not so much this century, but a couple of times, I think once or twice just lately here. Uh, and why the Electoral College and so forth. And that's another great debate in American circles, but you'd have to replace it with something. And then we'll take a look at any recounts. Usually there are two or three recounts that have to be carried out. And uh, some of those recounts are very irresolvable. And at the end, you have to have some commission or something to make a determination. And uh, thus the Electoral College and thus the House and Senate and sometimes the Supreme Court, depending. So um, we have some great uh, challenges. Uh, then after that, we will take a look at the lame duck session of Congress, which is a session that can happen mostly in election years when the Congress adjourns early and goes home. And then they, like for example, we're gonna try to deal with the budget sequester at that time in December. And uh, so that could be one of the most significant Congresses, but it's the outgoing members of Congress, not the new ones. So uh, it'll be some of the, some will, obviously the majority will still be there. So I'm just giving you an outline of my class at Seance Po. The class is full, so you can't transfer and go to it. But uh, uh, I'm just warming up today. So I will go and now we're gonna move to another place, are we? Is that right? Okay. And then who's going to ask me the question? I'll be glad to answer the questions. OK. Oh, now in Israel, you know how to hold elections, don't you, very well? You don't have disputes? Well, you do have disputes over there, too. Good. You're a smart. You're going to go far in life. You will, you will go far. OK. Well, thank you very much.